Hercules Christmas by Agatha Christie Audiobook 12x12 No, you killed him before you left the house the first time. No one saw him saw him alive after you left. It was all so easy for you. Simeon Lee expected you, yes, but he never sent for you. It was you who rang him up and spoke vaguely about an attempt at robbery. You said you would call upon him just before eight that night and would pretend to be collecting for a police charity. Simeon Lee had no suspicions. He did not know you were his son. You came and told him a tale of substituted diamonds. He opened the safe to show you that the real diamonds were safe in his possession. You apologized, came back to the hearth with him and, catching him unawares, you cut his throat, holding your hand over his mouth so that he shouldn't cry out. Child's play to a man of your powerful physique. Then you set the scene. You took the diamonds. You piled up tables and chairs, lamps and glasses, and twined a very thin rope or cord which you had brought and coiled round your body, in and out between them. You had with you a bottle of some freshly killed animal's blood to which you had added a quantity of sodium citrate. You sprinkled this about freely and added more sodium citrate to the pool of blood which flowed from Simeon Lee's wound. You made up up the fire so that the body should keep its warmth. Then you passed the two ends of the cord out through the narrow slit at the bottom of the window and let them hang down the wall. You left the room and turned the key from the outside. That was vital, since no one must, by any chance, enter that room. Then you went out and hid the diamonds in the stone sink garden. If, sooner or later, they were discovered there, they would only focus suspicion more strongly where you wanted it. On the members of Simeon Lee's legitimate family. A little before 9.15 you returned and, going up to the wall underneath the window, you pulled on the cord. That dislodged the carefully piled up structure you had arranged. Furniture and china fell with a crash. You pulled on one end of the cord and rewound it round your body under your coat and waistcoat. You had one further device. He turned to the others. Do you remember, all of you, how each of you described the dying scream of Mr. Lee in a different way? You, Mr. Lee, described it as the cry of a man in mortal agony. Your wife and David Lee both used the expression. A soul in hell. MRS David Lee, on the contrary, said it was the cry of someone who had no soul. She said it was inhuman, like a beast. It was Harry Lee who came nearest to the truth. He said it sounded like killing a pig. Do you know those long pink bladders that are sold at fairs with faces painted on them called dying pigs? As the air rushes out they give forth an inhuman wail. That, Sugden, was your final touch. You arranged one of those in the room. The mouth of it was stopped up with a peg, but that peg was connected to the cord. When you pulled on the cord the peg came out and the pig began to deflate. On top of the falling furniture came the scream of the dying pig. Dot. He turned once more to the others. You see now what it was that Pilar Estravados picked up. The superintendent had hoped to get there in time to retrieve that little wisp of rubber before anyone noticed it. However, he took it from Pilar quickly enough in his most official manner. But remember he never mentioned that incident to anyone. In itself, that was a singularly suspicious fact. I heard of it from Magdalene Lee and tackled him about it. He was prepared for that eventuality. He had snipped a piece from Mr. Lee's rubber sponge bag and produced that, together with a wooden peg. Superficially it answered to the same description a fragment of rubber and a piece of wood. It meant, as I realized at the time, absolutely nothing. But, fool that I was, I did not at once say, this means nothing, so it cannot have been there, and Superintendent Sugden is lying. No, I foolishly went on trying to find an explanation for it. It was not until Mademoiselle Estravados was playing with a balloon that burst, 
and she cried out that it must have been a burst balloon she picked up in Simeon Lee's room, that I saw the truth. You see now how everything fits in. The improbable struggle, which is necessary to establish a false time of death, the locked door so that nobody shall find the body too soon, the dying man's scream. The crime is now logical and reasonable. But from the moment that Pilar Estravados cried aloud her discovery about the balloon, she was a source of danger to the murderer. And if that remark had been heard by him from the house, which it well might, for her voice was high and clear and the windows were open, she herself was in considerable danger. Already she had given the murderer one very nasty moment. She had said, speaking of old Mr. Lee, he must have been very good looking when he was young. And had added, speaking directly to Sugden. Like you. She meant that literally, and Sugden knew it. No wonder Sugden went purple in the face and nearly choked. It was so unexpected and so deadly dangerous. He hoped, after that, to fix the guilt on her, but it proved unexpectedly difficult, since, as the old man's portionless granddaughter, she had obviously no motive for the crime. Later, when he overheard from the house her clear, high voice calling out its remark about the balloon, he decided on desperate measures. He set that booby trap when we were at lunch. Luckily, almost by a miracle, it failed, there was dead silence. Then Sugden said quietly. When were you sure? Poirot said. I was not quite sure till I brought home a false mustache and tried it on Simeon Lee's picture. Then the face that looked at me was yours. Sugden said. God wrought his soul in hell. I'm glad I did it. Part December 7th 28th Lydia Lee said. Pilar, I think you had better stay with us until we can arrange something definite for you. Pilar said meekly. You are very good, Lydia. You are nice. You forgive people quite easily without making a fuss about it. Lydia said, smiling. I still call you Pilar, though I suppose your name is something else. Yes, I am really Conchita Lopez. Conchita is a pretty name too. You are really almost too nice, Lydia. But you don't need to be bothered by me. I am going to marry Stephen, and we are going to South Africa. Lydia said, smiling. Well, that rounds off things very nicely. Pilar said timidly. Since you have been so kind, do you think, Lydia, that one day we might come back and stay with you perhaps for Christmas and then we could have the crackers and the burning raisins and those shiny things on a tree and the little snowmen? Certainly, you shall come and have a real English Christmas. That will be lovely. You see, Lydia, I feel that this year it was not a nice Christmas at all. Lydia caught her breath. She said. No, it was not a nice Christmas, too Harry said. Well, goodbye, Alfred. Don't suppose you'll be troubled by seeing much of me. I'm off to Hawaii. Always meant to live there if I had a bit of money. Alfred said. Goodbye, Harry. I expect you'll enjoy yourself. I hope so. Harry said rather awkwardly. Sorry I riled you so much, old man. Rotten sense of humor I've got. Can't help trying to pull a fellow's leg. Alfred said with an effort. Suppose I must learn to take a joke. Harry said with relief. Well so long. Three Alfred said. David, Lydia and I have decided to sell up this place. I thought perhaps you'd like some of the things that were our mother's her chair and that footstool. You were always her favorite. David hesitated a minute. Then he said slowly. Thanks for the thought, Alfred, but do you know, I don't think I will. I don't want anything out of the house. I feel it's better to break with the past altogether. Alfred said. Yes, I understand. 
maybe you're right. For George said. Well, goodbye, Alfred. Goodbye, Lydia. What a terrible time we have been through. There's the trial coming on, too. I suppose the whole disgraceful story is bound to come out sudden being er my father's son. One couldn't arrange for it to be put to him, I suppose, that it would be better if he pleaded advanced communist views and dislike of my father as a capitalist something of that kind. Lydia said. My dear George, do you really imagine that a man like Sugden would tell lies to soothe our feelings? George said. Er perhaps not. No, I see your point. All the same, the man must be mad. Well, goodbye again. Magdalene said. Goodbye. Next year do let's all go to the Riviera or somewhere for Christmas and be really gay. George said. Depends on the exchange. Magdalene said. Darling, don't be mean. V. Alfred came out on the terrace. Lydia was bending over a stone sink. She straightened up when she saw him. He said with a sigh. Well they ve all gone. Lydia said. Yes what a blessing. It is, rather. Alfred said. You'll be glad to leave here. She asked. Will you mind very much? No, I shall be glad. There are so many interesting things we can do together. To live on here would be to be constantly reminded of that nightmare. Thank God it's all over. Lydia said. Thanks to Hercule Poirot. Yes. You know, it was really amazing the way everything fell into place when he explained it. I know. Like when you finish a jigsaw puzzle and all the queer shaped bits you swear won't fit in anywhere find their places quite naturally. Alfred said. There's one little thing that never fitted in. What was George doing after he telephoned? Why wouldn't he say? Don't you know? I knew all the time. He was having a look through your papers on your desk. Oh. No, Lydia, no one would do a thing like that. George would. He's frightfully curious about money matters. But of course he couldn't say so. He'd have had to be actually in the dock before he'd have owned up to that. Alfred said. Are you making another garden? Yes. What is it this time? I think, said Lydia, it's an attempt at the Garden of Eden. A new version without any serpent and Adam and Eve are definitely middle-aged. Alfred said gently. Dear Lydia, how patient you have been all these years. You have been very good to me. Lydia said. But, you see, Alfred, I love you, Six Colonel Johnson said. God bless my soul. Then he said. Upon my word. And finally, once more. God bless my soul. He leaned back in his chair and stared at Poirot. He said plaintively. My best man. What's the police coming to? Poirot said. Even policemen have private lives. Sugden was a very proud man. Colonel Johnson shook his head. To relieve his feelings he kicked at the logs in the grate. He said jerkily. I always say a nothing like a wood fire. Hercule Poirot, conscious of the drafts round his neck, thought to himself. Poor moi. Every time the central heating. The end. Audiobook generated by, read with the ears.